Welcome to another episode of Mysteries Unknown. In tonight's podcast, I've got Daryl with me, and this has got to be one of the strangest Class A encounters with Bigfoot I personally have ever heard. You're talking about everything from orbs to government vehicles to screaming on the property to Class A encounters, Bigfoot peeking in windows, you name it. This story has got it. He also has video and audio evidence to show you guys as well as some photos. This is a good one, guys, and you don't want to miss it. But before I jump into that, as always, if you've got a story you want to send me, you can email me at video at jscreativear.com. Let's jump right into the story. Daryl, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Well, man, I'm very excited to have you here, and I know we have a lot of things to cover. So let's go back to the beginning when you purchased this property in Oregon and kind of walk us through some of these experiences. I had recently retired from California, and um, I wanted to move to Oregon for all the hunting and fishing, you know, and the beauty. So we moved up, and my wife was still working. Uh, We bought this property out of Cottage Grove, Oregon, which is probably about, oh, a hundred miles, I would guess, to the south of Portland, Oregon. So it was down, you know, a ways away from all that. But uh, it was out in the country. It had a couple acres with it that backed up to government land, BLM land, whatever you want to call it. And it was a big old farmhouse that was originally uh, one of the founders of the area's smaller house that the contractor that we bought it from had built onto. So it was a big old five bedroom, two bath farmhouse out in the country. And when we moved in, it had a, um, it had a, a woodshed is basically all it was. And, uh, I, I hired some guys and we turned it into a shop. But anyway, when we first got there, it was December and it's Oregon. So of course it was raining. So, I would go out at night to take my little dog out to go to the bathroom before we went to bed and I would hear strange sounds because the property was backed up to, I don't know, 100,000 or hundred thousands of acres of government land, BLM land, whatever you want to call it. Weird sounds that I hadn't heard before. I had never really heard panthers and stuff like my dad talked about out here in Arkan out there in Arkansas. He'd hear when he was a kid. So I'd heard mountain lions and you know, I'd been hunting all my life. I've been hunting in the Sierra Nevadas and around. So I, I kind of know the sounds of basically all the animals that are out out on the west coast area. So it was none of that. It was just very strange. So that was kind of how it all started with that property, which is known as the Owl Moon Lab. There's a book out by my friend Tobe Johnson. Uh, I always say when I first got there, I was normal, (laughs) but uh, I don't know. But anyways, we're we're out there and, you know, the weather cleared up. It's going into like maybe March or April, like now. And me and my wife were out putting in a garden. We were doing the raised garden boxes. we heard something screaming up in those woods that would just like almost vibrate through the air. It's hard to explain it. And it sounds like a, a T-Rex and an African lion had a child and it, and it was angry. <laughs> but uh, so that kind of started all the weirdness. And um, they have a thing out there every year. A guy named Todd Neese puts it on. I don't know. You've probably seen him. He's on all the uh, shows and whatever. It's called Beachfoot. It's not at the beach. (laughs) It's kind of inland on a river. But um, so I get there because I'm starting to have all this, you know, weird sounds and Bigfoot activity, I guess. So I get there and I meet everybody. Bob Gimlin is there, you know, the Cliff Brockman. It's, It's a private venue that you have to be invited to. So all the all the big names were there, basically. So I sat down by the campfire that night and um 
I met a guy named Ron Moorhead. He, um, he, he's the guy that did the Sierra sounds, you know, where the Bigfoots came in their, their deer camp in the Sierra Nevadas in California. And I was telling him, you know, <clears throat> I was having these sounds and weird things happening. And he goes, Oh, there's a guy in your area named, uh, Toby Johnson, you know, hit him up on Facebook or whatever and tell him, I said, yeah, you're a good guy. And, and he lives right there near you. So he can come out and kind of give you some guidance on all the stuff that's going on. So, so I met Tobe Johnson down at the lake. They had done a thing down there, him and a bunch of guys, Cliff Brockman and them, where they uh, cast, I think, over 100 footprints. It was called the London Trackway. I mean, you can look it up on YouTube. It's been a while now. But anyway, I, I actually met him down there where those footprints were cast. And then he came over to the property. He actually... Um, he had a camp trailer and he was a truck driver so he he kind of started staying at the property started having all this stuff happening and uh one day i had drawn an elk elk tag which is kind of like a special draw it takes about every five years to get one and it was the last day of the season and he had just came home from work in the afternoon it's probably two or three o'clock so and I'd been elk hunting up behind the property in these areas, and I had seen all these weird structures that Bigfoots do, I guess. They're like X's, and uh, they twist trees up. They they make little huts and shelters out of big trees that, you know, a human couldn't lift. So anyway, we're driving up to this area, and it's kind of, it's a little bit early to do the evening hunt for elk. So we're driving around, and I go, hey, I was up here a few days ago and I saw these weird structure things. So you're the Bigfoot expert. Let's go check them out and I'll show you. So on our way up to this area, which was an old logging road, um, skitter road or whatever you call them off to the right side of the road. And it, you know, it had been rainy and, and there's red clay out there. Like you're in Oklahoma, we come around the turn and, and on the embankment, here's two big impressions in the side of the red clay we get out and he goes stop so we get out and and it looks like somebody took their little brother out of the back seat because they were mad at him and just jammed his head in that mud just two perfect side by side um impressions so we're like wow that's weird and we got to looking in there and, and there was hair in it and it was like a darkish reddish dark black and red color so he's like oh my gosh i think a bigfoot kneeled down right here because to the left of that coming off the embankment was a, a heavily traveled deer trail so it was like a perfect ambush point you know if you kneel down there something's coming down the hill can't kind of stop and it would just be a perfect spot for him to grab a deer or whatever so anyways we um he went back to town and got some materials to cast those knee impressions we were calling them and uh, we got hair samples we did you know with the the latex gloves and the alcohol and the tweezers and the envelopes and we did everything real sanitary toby you know he sent a hair some hair samples to a lady named cindy dosen which she has the uh, hominid enigma enigma laboratory up in canada She's also um, a member of the uh, Olympic Project out of Washington. But he sent her these uh, these hairs and not and not telling her anything. And uh, at the time, we were doing like a live stream thing at a pub there in Cottage Grove where, where I lived. And um, so he just out of the blue, we didn't know what these things were or anything. He puts her up on the screen, a live call like this, and she goes, these are unknown human-like hairs with uh, from lower extremities of something. And she knew none of this. He didn't give her any information. So they had no medulla. Um, they were, uh, there's only been like six or seven um, known, you know, authenticated Bigfoot hairs like that. And that was number six or seven. I can't remember. That was the thing. And then we were hearing the sounds and um, 
we brought those uh, those knee knee impressions back, put them in the garage part of the house for a couple of weeks until the red clay dried on them. Then we transferred them into the shop, the crazy shop where all the craziness started happening. But anyway, probably my first deal with the Bigfoot there, although we were getting weird stuff like boom, boom, boom on the back of the door at night. I mean, we're out in the middle of nowhere, 10 miles from town. So here I am upstairs in the big master bedroom. I grab my 40 Glock, run down in my underwear with my big old flashlight, nothing. I could shine the light for a long way is nothing. It's just freaky, you know, like somebody's door dashing you out, you know, in the middle of the sticks. But and then on the side of the house, we hear boom, boom, boom. So um, one night uh, we had we were upstairs and it, and it, when it was in kind of summery months, it was warm. So we would open the windows and open the doors and let the breeze blow through the top of the house. So we had motion sensor lights. One night about, I don't know, 2 a.m. or so, my wife had just gotten up to go to the bathroom and she noticed that the motion sensor lights were on on that side where the shop was. And she's like, hey, is there somebody out there? And we had a fence around the place that was about four foot tall. So of course me, I get up and as I'm walking across the hall to the other bedroom with the open window, the light timed out. <laughs> So it got dark again, but it was, there was a moon so I could see. So I'm looking like this down in the backyard, you know, from upstairs. I had the cat bird seat up there real good, like a hunting blind up against the house. I see this black figure and I'm like, what the heck? And, uh, it's just standing still against the house like this, like it doesn't want to move to set the light off again. So me, I'm just, I go. I just whistle and this thing takes off and I saw it just a blur. It was so fast, but it, it was so strong. It sounded like, you know, when a horse will get up to shake the dirt off and then that sound it makes, it sounded like that. It was so powerful, the thrust of the takeoff and it just took off running. I just saw a black blur at an angle, went over the fence. I just heard ping, like hitting the top of the fence and it was gone. That was my, probably my first experience there with the, with the Bigfoot at that house. Hey, it sounds like you you definitely moved into a, into a hot spot, and it's very cool that you've got the evidence that you do have. And you know that night, the first night you heard that thing banging on the door and then and then seeing it out there, what did you know about Bigfoot? Did you know anything at all about what it was? Not really. I didn't, you know, I just worked pretty much 12, 14 hours a day, six days a week mostly. I, I wasn't into that. I thought, yeah, right. You know, Bigfoot, Loch Ness monster. It's just and then, you know, kind of once I got to Oregon and saw how thick it is, you know, in the vine maples and all that, I was thinking, you know, this some could live off the road here 10 feet and you'd never see it. It's just it could just hide every time you came around. And, you know, they can hear you coming for miles on those logging roads up there. It's quiet. You know, the gravel road, you can hear vehicles forever. So it's not like they want to run across in front of you they already know you're there coming yeah i think the loudest creature in the forest is usually us you know we're we're pretty loud was even when we try to be really quiet you know they these things can hear us a long ways off when you saw this creature standing out the back there with the being lit by the by the moon how tall do you think this thing was well there was a on that two-story house there was it was um it was built on a concrete foundation which was about two feet and then the window there where it was, was another bedroom. And so the top of the window, I think was about 10 feet up. You know, it wasn't low. It was up on the house for the bottom, maybe eight to 10 feet. So on that window, we got an impression of a big face because they're kind of greasy. They have, you know, they have their skin or whatever they they, they have a lot of oil in their skin. So on that window, we got, you could see the forehead. You could see, I mean, it was huge. I got a big head, but like twice as big as mine. You could see the nostrils, flares. You could even see the 
where the snot or the where it was breathing with its face against the window. You can see its lips perfectly. And uh, on the screen, the screen was on the bottom. There was a giant handprint and, and the fingers had torn five holes in the screen. So, yeah, it was crazy. But you could just see the total face impression on that window where that thing was standing. That is crazy. I, I don't know how you slept uh, on that property because I don't think I'd have slept very good after knowing that thing is out there like that. But uh, you talked about the the shed a lot. Why don't you fill us in on some of the stuff that happened um, while you were out there on the property in that shed with the shed? Um, well, after we built the shed, it was basically a few months old. Tobe Johnson moved in on the side with his little travel trailer. We know we had a few acres, so there was room. There was a gravel area in front of the house and then the, the other logging road that went out to the main road. We kind of had to come up a logging road about almost a mile to get to, um, it was a warehouser logging access road to get to the property. That's how far in there we were. But we put that, um, those knee impressions in there and um, things started happening. Things started showing up inside this locked shop, brand new shop. It had big roll up doors for RV uh, electric, you know, just like your garage door opener, but they were the big heavy duty ones. And then it had a man door on the side. So on that man door, in the frame of the door, there was big greasy fingerprints, like something tried to tear the, the door frame, the door jam out and left big, huge, greasy fingerprints. It didn't tear it out, it didn't damage it. And then also on the, I mean, this is a brand new shop, on the uh, down downspout from the um, gutter on the other end of the shop, we measured, I think it's 10 feet up, something squished, just took and squished the downspout and you could see the greasy fingerprints where it's squished. It didn't squeeze it all the way shut, but it squished it in with its hand. Like it was angry and it wanted to get in there and get those knee impressions. But all of a sudden, here's this, here's this lock shop. First thing I think that showed up is uh, we were kind of, you know, getting the hairs and stuff out of that, that um, knee impressions. And uh, the red clay was kind of a cap on there, like an orange peel cap, you know, that we peeled off. But we were getting the hairs off, so uh, came in the morning. Here's this little blue, um, like a kid's dinosaur. That was the first thing they brought, I think. A little toy dinosaur sitting there on the knee impressions. Lock shop. Everything's locked. By then, we had a ring camera on the door, on our front door nothing on the cameras and um and and all the gifts i mean we had by the time we moved there we probably had 40 50 gifts that it would bring and uh or they would bring or whatever but they would seem to like they had some i don't know where they got them but most of them would have like a patina on them like mud or moss you know how in those areas mossy stuff will grow you know from the moisture patina stuff but it had that on it and uh yeah and then all of a sudden you know inside that shop weird things started happening weird noises i would put the recorder in there also what i ended up doing is i set up in the backyard pointing towards the blm land i set up a parabolic with a sony recorder because we, we were hearing so many of those sounds. So I probably recorded about, I don't know, 1400 hours. I would go out there diligently every night when it wasn't raining and put that stuff out. I'd go out probably about 9, 30, 10 when I went to bed and I'd get up at five or 4.30 and, and then, you know, go get it about six usually. But, um, and then, you know, I had the Audacity um, program that I would sit there and yeah, it got very tiring, but that's where I picked up the sounds. And I still have on a, a thumb drive or whatever, I still have about 1,200 hours that I haven't even looked at of the sounds that we were getting. But inside that shop, yeah, we um, it would just be banging like somebody in there with a ball-peen hammer just beating, beating the walls in. 
You'd go in the morning, not a scratch, a mark, nothing moved, anything. But on the recorder, it would sound just like, you know, total war went on in there with hammers. It's just so hard to explain why all this stuff happened after you put that uh, impression, you know, inside the shop. You know, it's almost like they just wanted to get that back. But then how do you answer those questions of, you know, hearing the sounds and then nothing being out there, damaging the, sh damaging the shop and, and all those kinds of things. Um, how, did that, uh, how did that so far, all these experiences, how did that change your life? Uh, it just makes you more aware of... At first, it kind of messes with your head because you're thinking, is there some weirdo tweaker hiding behind my truck, you know, doing this stuff or somebody messing with you? But I knew no one can get in the shop. No one can get past the camera. Um, it, it, it messes with your head, you know, if you don't, you know, if you let it get to you, I guess. But um, it was just so subtle, you know, that, and stuff started happening so much, you just kind of get numb to it, I think. You know, and a lot of little, a lot of little subtlety things like little sticks laid on the front deck that almost look like the pie symbol, you know, the, the thing. A lot of things in the number three, like three rocks setting on the rail of the deck. Three rocks setting on the hood of my pickup. Three rocks setting in the back of my pickup. Just different things like that almost you know they would happen for a few days in a row and then maybe there's three or four days nothing did you ever have another uh you know visual encounter on the property after that night what happened was you know my wife being a counselor and she was actually working at a at a facility where she needed to um and then covid happened so she had to do um all her stuff online you know in a secure environment so out there we had our internet was not good at all so she ended up having to like either stay at our daughters where they had good internet so we ended up selling the property is what it ended up being moving into town so we could have good internet service for her job for the next couple of years i had a habituation area up above the property where all those sounds were coming from I just went up there and put peanut butter on the trees and cookies and and they would show up. They would take everything. So I, I tried to do some little booby traps, you know, try to catch them, try to get hair samples, um, fingerprints, all that. So I would do things like the peanut butter on the tree and then put my game cam up. So I got some weird pictures on that game cam, almost like a... Have you seen the show Predator with Arnold Schwarzenegger? My game camera's got some of that on it where you'll see the peanut butter vanish off the tree and you got that distortion on the tree that looks like, just like that Predator. Yeah, also after we, I didn't say this, but after we put the knee impressions in that shop, I came out one morning and one of the shop doors was open. You know, the one of the, with the electric motor it was open and there was some muddy boot prints into the shop on the brand new concrete. The boot prints went up to the knee impressions, but they didn't go out. So another weird mind boggling thing, unless the guy could walk perfectly backwards. <laughs> and then uh, I think two days later, there was of course the black suburban in front of the house for about four hours game the you know the cameras caught it all blacked out no license plate and then a few couple weeks later there was a white van all blacked out windows i was home that day and it was just sitting out there i didn't go out and talk to him i was like oh boy here we go they never got out of the vehicle just sat there and about about uh, maybe a month after that me and um me and toad johnson you know we would talk in the day his trailer was there weird things would happen to his trailer there'd be 
you know, the rocks up on top of his awning that he had out and different items. But um, we were talking on our phone and we kept noticing that you'd get clicks and pops and weird sounds and buzzing. And and uh, so we thought, well, maybe the government's, you know, listening to us, which now we all know they don't even need FISA. You know, they can just do whatever they want. But anyways, with it. Within two days, both of our phones just completely quit working. <clears throat> and I took my phone to, um, oh, shoot, the phone place. I can't remember. Verizon. It was a Verizon store there. And the gal's like, I don't know what happened to your phone. And everything on my phone was gone. And she couldn't get it back. I mean, the, you know, the new phones don't have the little SIM cards or whatever anymore. But she says, no, nah, everything is just erased off your phone. And the same thing on Tobe Johnson's phone. Just gone. And no one touched our phones. I mean, just. You know, I often wonder and think about how much the government knows about these creatures. Because they obviously know. And um, on your property, you know, somebody's showing up like that and then walking into your shop. But then they're not having tracks back out and the SUV parked out front. Things like that, man. You're, you're very fortunate to to be here to share that story you know um there's a lot of confidential things that i can't i can't talk about from you know being in law enforcement and things i've seen but you know nothing like that but you know nothing about the government surprises me and i definitely think they know about these creatures and um have you been back to that property since all this stuff happened since you moved since we moved yeah i i'm pretty good friends with the people that bought the property and uh they they say they still hear the 900 pound monkey on the front porch banging around but but they're not they're older people and they're not into any of that so they just kind of you know go to bed at seven and get up at five and drink their coffee basically they don't care about any of that kind of life of anything which i didn't either when i moved in there yeah that's how it generally starts is you either don't believe or heard a bigfoot and like you know whatever but after you've had these experiences it, it definitely changes your opinion I'm really curious to know, especially with all the experiences that you had with it, get the DNA and, and physical evidence and photos and audio. What do you think Bigfoot is, Daryl? I mean, I, I would love to know your opinion. At first, yeah, a monkey out in the woods. I was like total flesh and blood. Yeah, it's got so much room to hide. It can hear you coming. It's been hiding out forever. They bury their dead. They don't want nothing to do with people. You know, the whole um, flesh and blood theory and all that. And then as all that weirdness started happening in that shop and everything around there and seeing that flashing light out in the back at night, dropping those orbs out into the woods where all that stuff was coming from. And that was confirmed by the neighbor, the guy that lived maybe a quarter of a mile or less away. He had been living there since like the 90s and he had been seeing that thing come and do that and he and what it would do it was almost like uh it would um like surge in and out of power like uh real pretty lights you know like a jellyfish you know you see those on some of those shows real like rainbow color pretty lights so he named it the chandelier so he just called it the chandelier i saw the chandelier last night and his name was chris he was a really super nice family he was jehovah's witness so uh, maybe he's a little crazy there, but anyways, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't just super like Amish type people and did, wouldn't lie to save his life, you know, and, and he had been seeing that forever. It, it makes you wonder, I don't know. And I know a lot of these encounters, there are always, not always, a lot of these encounters, there's orbs involved, you know, people see orbs and lights and all kinds of weird stuff. And that's, you know, that's why I personally think that they're not just flesh and blood there's more of a supernatural aspect to them and you know it, biblically i have my own thoughts but you know it, who knows right like I, I there's there's no way we are we're gonna know um until somebody actually i guess brings a body up or something like that but uh now that you've moved and you're in a completely different area and i think i probably know but would you want to see another one if you had the opportunity uh yeah i mean that's you know i I'm probably not good for those shows because I'm not a person that gets like, oh, my God, you know how they want the shock factor of people. 
I, you know, I, I worked heavy construction forever and rent and thousands of personalities you deal with in that field. And, um, so the shock factor for me is gone. I mean, I'm not much scares me. You know, I've seen death. I've been buried 30 feet under the ground. So, um, it takes a lot to, to scare me, but I was scared there a couple times, but anyway, yeah, to get back to that habituation area, one day uh, I'd been doing it for almost two years, I think. I'd go up there every few weeks and put out peanut butter. I would get some real thick two-sided tape from Hobby Lobby and uh, go to Walmart and get some, you know, the flat of eggs. It's like three or four flats, whatever. And I would boil half of them in... Um, and then put the other half raw up there. But I would do a total Easter egg hunt with like 100 eggs, like a five-gallon bucket full. Behind the barks, old dead trees, everything. I would come up there in a week. I would not even find an egg shell. They were just gone. So I was like, wow. Their favorite food is going to be eggs and peanut butter. <laughs> so anyways, I I made a cradle with, with, with an egg with a two-sided tape, hung it on the vine maple. And uh, me and my buddy, Mark Parker, he's a bow hunter. And uh, so he came up there with me that day and he's down there and the egg is gone. I mean, and it was a raw egg. And I was thinking, yeah, they're going to have to break that sucker to get it out of there. Not an eggshell, no yolk, nothing. But huge fingerprints on that two-sided tape. So that was one of my booby traps that I got big fingerprints and then um, there was a, you know, those big rat traps, you can buy them at, at like some like um, hardware stores or whatever. They're huge sticky traps that they use out on ranches and farms. So I got my stool and up on the tree about, I don't know, as high as I could reach. I'm only 5'10", so probably eight feet or so. <clears throat> I nailed it up there, pulled it back, put peanut butter and cookies and jammed it up against there. So the Bigfoot would have to, <clears throat> so I got this big old hair, reddish black hair stuck on that, <laughs> that uh, rat trap. You know, that was one of my theories on how to get, but then I already had a ton of hairs and I had we had already, um, I'd already spent $300 on HydraCal doing the foot impressions. We had just boxes full of them. We'd see them up there all the time. So like I say, after your, <clears throat> I mean, some people, you know, it, you just get kind of numb to all that because it doesn't really go anywhere unless you've got a body, footprints, fingerprints, hair samples, um, weirdness, cloak stuff. It just, it's like this country right now in two weeks that nobody remembers anything. You know, it's just a two week country right now. Somebody could kill a hundred people and it'd be like two weeks. Uh, what happened? Nobody, you know, that's the way it is with Bigfoot. Unless you've got a body and you're sitting in the park. It's none of this stuff matters anymore. Plus all the the fake stuff on the Internet. And We're inundated with so much information today. Like there's so much stuff thrown at us every single day that we're just saturated with stuff. And, you know, after you collect so much evidence and there's only so much trace evidence you can collect before it becomes the same over and over. And you definitely was kind of an, in a hot spot. And yeah, I, uh, that area there that I had habituated, I went, my grandson went with me one day. He's a young guy, like 21 years old. And, um, so we start down the hill there. You got to go down the hill a little, you know, 500 feet or so to where I had the game cam set up. So he goes down to the left on the trail and it's kind of muddy, you know, cause it's rainy. So here I am just going real slow. And I knew to get my phone out with the camera ready. So he goes down over here to the left and I just see this black thing take off from that area where I had put out all this stuff. So I get my camera and I start hitting, just taking pictures and there's kind of a little gully there to the right. And that's where I got that picture of that one walking away. I saw it perfectly. It was walking really fast with its head leaned over forward. And it just walked right up through the gully, went across the logging road, on up into the thick 
the thick uh, brush and stuff up on the hill. Wow. Did did you smell anything when you had this encounter? Did you did you smell anything at all? I didn't smell anything at all. You know, it makes you wonder why sometimes people, you know, talk about smelling these smells and then sometimes they don't. I, I think maybe the males maybe have a, a defense type mechanism. You know, it could be something like that. But it's always very, very interesting, man. And I, I know that that's a lot to unpack, man. And I, I, I would love to have you back on the show to talk a little bit more about this because like you said, you could probably talk about this stuff for three or four days. So um, if you're op- up for it, man, I'd love to have you back on again. Sure. And I'll, I'll send you more stuff by then and you can check it. I got stuff for days. Um, also, Toby Johnson, the guy that was kind of my partner in crime with all that stuff was going on. He wrote a book called The Owl Moon Lab. <clears throat> because the night that we cast those knee impressions, it was the owl moon. You know, they have the different names of the moons. So, and then I was always doing these stupid little experiments trying to catch them, you know, with the the tape and the eggs and the, and I got more stories about the eggs. And But look at that book. It's called The Owl Moon Lab by Toby Johnson. And he has QR codes in there of weird stuff that happens and you can go on your phone and it actually will show you and, and you can hear the sounds. It's, it's kind of cool how they did it. He did it with um, Doug Hycheck, the guy from Monster Quest. He helped him do that book, I guess, but it's, it's kind of. Yeah, that is awesome. Guys, make sure to make sure to check out that book. Go give, give them some love. And I, I'm excited to, to, that you came on the show and shared that. I know my audience really loved that. And I can't wait to have you back on again and share more of those, more of those experiences because I know you got a lot more to cover. But guys, thanks for being here tonight. I uh, hope you enjoyed that podcast. We had a lot of things to talk about. And there's just so much to unpack that I think we need to have you back on to talk more about it, get into more some of the details. But thanks for being here. I, sh- I really appreciate all the support. I couldn't do it without you guys but like i always say stay prayed up and we'll talk to you next episode